Hello and welcome to Pookie Ponders, the podcast where I explore big questions with brilliant people. Today's question is, how can we build bridges between home and school for children with additional needs? And I'm in conversation with Ginny Bootman. Hi everyone, my name is Ginny Bootman. I'm a special needs coordinator of two primary schools in Northamptonshire. I have been the head teacher, I've been the um, senior leader, the class teacher, the PE coordinator, I've been all of those things. Um, I love to talk about the role which, which empathy plays within the classroom and the school context. And I also write about it as well. I'm on Twitter at Senko Girl, and you can also find me at GinnyBootman.com. Perfect. And our episode question today is how can we build bridges between home and school for children with additional needs? So if you wouldn't mind just making a start on that massive question. <laughs> I think there has to be in many ways a consciousness about this. I think we as teachers and as special needs coordinators can inadvertently build bridges. I mean, sorry, um, not build bridges, we need to consciously build bridges, we can break the bridges down. So we have to think about ways that we can make connections with parents and carers and those who are involved with the children. So one of the ways that I found out which really, really surprised me and was something kooky I hadn't been doing. And when it came to my attention, I changed my practice immediately. And I call it, um, call me by my name. Just call me by my name. In fact, when we're in a meeting with parents, let's ask them how they want to be addressed. So I introduce myself, I say, I'm Ginny Bootman, you can call me Ginny. And for any Senkos out there, you decide how you want to be addressed, how you feel most comfortable. And in the same way, the people at the meeting then tell us how they want to be addressed. I cannot believe the difference that makes. I have spoken to parents and parents say when they are called mum, dad, grandma, granddad, auntie, they feel so small. They actually don't feel as valued. And there becomes this, and I talk about it a lot, this hierarchy, a perceived hierarchy. So by us asking them how they want to be called, we actually are leveling everything out. And I'm very much for, um, I call it flattening the hierarchy. The parents are the experts and we all need to work together to make sure that we can get the best for our children. So that's my first top tip that's come from parents. And Pookie, it comes from parents. Parents constantly tell me ways that we can improve those links between um, home and school. So that, that's kind of my first top tip. Um, my next one is about meetings. Have you ever been given the time that you have to go to a meeting at school? and you are the 10.45, and you're like, right, that's at least my whole morning wiped out, if not my whole day. Yeah. And actually it might be parents are working, it might be there are other siblings at home, it might be um, that there may be a younger sibling and they have a nap time, all of these things. Once again, we have to consciously think about it. So what I aim to do, and, and I am able to do this because I'm purely a Senko of two schools now, is, is I give options for timings. So I, I ask parents when would be the best times for them, give them options, and we find a suitably, it's a suitably convenient time. And by doing that, once again, we are valuing one another. And actually it goes two ways, doesn't it? The parents are valuing us and we are valuing the parents. And I have been known to have a meeting five o'clock in the evening on a Zoom so that both parents can, can, can be at the meeting or a parent and a grandparent, who, whoever um, wants to be at that meeting. So I think timing is very important. Who attends? So I once had a meeting and I thought it was just a mum coming. 
she brought the grandma you know they both came in together the mum and the grandma and I thought oh I'm in for it here I'm in for it because I wasn't expecting two people I was expecting and you know as a teacher we sometimes have that that feeling of oh gosh they've brought in the reinforcements they've brought in the reinforcements I couldn't have been any more wrong I couldn't have been any more wrong the meeting I had two different pairs of ears listening about the same child that they cared for so much and the feedback I got from the parent was, do you know what? I wasn't going to bring my mum. But my mum said, can I come along as well? And the conversation we had in the car on the way home was brilliant because we all, we both heard different things. And that was really interesting for me. And now I say, bring however many people you like and I'll bring the chairs. Because <laughs> people... People hear different things and otherwise one person will go to the meeting, won't they? They will hear the things that are important to them and then they go home and feed that back. It's like if any of us go to a meeting, we hear the things that interest us most or yeah. that we're most worried about. Then we go home and it it's not the same message, is it? It's the diluted bits become even more diluted and the concentrated bits become even more concentrated. So I would say invite more people. It's a positive. It's a real positive to invite, invite, invite more people um, to the meeting. Um, how do we have the meeting? Some people like face to face meetings. Some people like Zoom. Some people like a phone call and some people like face to face. Once again, it's down to really personal choice. Give the options, see what people like, what they would prefer and what we can accommodate as, as a school. And that seems to work very well. Um, I think emails are a really, really interesting one. And, and I have to say, I found a little bit contentious. I'm not an email person, Pookie. I feel that emails can be misconstrued. Yes. You can end up having what I call the spiky conversation via email. And the spiky email comes and then you can, because of the way you're feeling and the way your, your brain has perceived it and the way you're feeling, you can end up with the war of the spiky emails um, in its most technical term there. Sounds like a rubbish film. <laughs> <laughs> the war of the spiky emails. And I think um, the way I deal with it, and this is just me personally, I'd be interested in what you think, Pookie, is if I get the spiky email, I tend to reply or respond either with a phone call yeah. or with a face-to-face -face conversation. But can I just say, they are really scary at times and you have to, you know, you have to take your brave pill and just go, right, I will make the phone call. And inevitably, they actually are better than we think they will be. And I think it, it brings to the forefront this whole idea of homeschool links. We as teachers get a little bit anxious as well when we are going to speak to parents and parents get anxious speaking to parent um, it, you know is a two-way it's a two-way thing that we all do care yeah and I suppose the question there is finding what we've got in common rather than what divides us perhaps isn't it because actually we all want what's best for the child hopefully at the end of the day we do and I think this I think this is something that is really interesting how do Senkos come into being Pookie do you choose to be a Senko or are you given the Senko role? And I've been thinking about this a lot because I feel that my role as a Senko has evolved over time. I was given the role as Senko and through my life experiences and through the amazing children I've worked with over time, I have grown into the Senko role and I love my role. And I think as schools, we have to 
consider who is the best person to be the Senko in the same way, or maybe not the same way, but you know, who is the best person for each coordinator role in the school? But I think the, the Senko, I think it's a bit off them. You know, I do feel it's, it's a, it's a, it's a part of us. I think if we were a stick of rock, <laughs> it would say it would say Senko yeah. through through the middle and you've hit you've hit the nail on the head it's about the shared caring for children and it's about not just the child now but the child in the future and and that comes back to we need to have time we need to have time as Senkos to be able to do our role really successfully and to be able to immerse ourselves in it and to be able to do the paperwork and to be able to meet the parents and to be able to have those conversations with the parents and the teachers because we are at its best an interface often between the home and the class teachers and, and the teaching assistants. So. It is, it is about everyone wanting the best for the children in our care. Absolutely. And do you have different kinds of parent and carer types or conversations that you have? Because I'm imagining that someone who might be listening to or watching this might have a particular um, you know, parent or carer in mind. And I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of two that I get asked about a lot. And one is the expert parent carer who perhaps thinks that they know what's going on for their child but they perhaps haven't received that label or diagnosis yet and they are trying desperately to be heard and might feel quite unheard by the system um, and then the other I'm thinking about is a parent or carer who doesn't seem very keen to engage and who we find it very difficult to build those bridges with at all and we know um, that a child who perhaps is struggling with I don't know, learning to read, say, would really benefit from that input at home, but we're struggling to engage with them. They're the two that I get asked about most, but you might have others. And I don't know if you have different strategies for working with those different kinds. I think whatever parent I'm working with, the key is for me to listen and to listen to understand. I have quite a lot of parents who they come under generally two two um, two headings one is the the parent who's very emotionally charged when they come in mm -hmm. they come in and they are they are they can be very very upset and they come in and they come in with the story of their child and the story of their child may be linked to their story when they were a child as well mm. and there can be quite a lot of anger there because what i find is that parents have experienced something in their childhood and they were never given the support they want so they have their armor on and they are going to fight so that their child doesn't go through what they went through and I listen to understand and I listen to learn and it's really important that, that the parent is able to say everything everything to me this is especially this happens when I have parents who are choosing whether their child is going to move from another setting because that has got a lot of emotion with it. Yes. Because imagine that a parent, for whatever reason, has decided to move their child from one setting to another setting. They are moving their child from their peers. They might be moving them out of the catchment area for the secondary school. This needs to be right. So they have their armor on and they are testing me. They are testing me and they are testing me about my ethos, about my values, about my track record. And do you know what? Absolutely, absolutely ask anything you like. 
And I will be honest back to you and I will be transparent. I think as thinkers, we have to be honest and transparent back. So listening to all of that and allowing them to tell their story. And I say it's like a balloon, Pookie, that has been blown up and let it go. And it has to, it has to, all of the air has to be released and they have to be allowed to say their story. And then they're ready to listen. So I have those parents. Then I have the parents who come in, the experts, as you said, who are bringing facts, figures and logic. That's what they're bringing. And they come in with the folder. Yes, the research and, has been done. Yes, and they have come in and they go, this is, this is my child, this is their diagnosis, and I am presented with that. And I think it is so important that I acknowledge that. Mm. I think in my, in my opinion, we have to accept that folder. And I say, would you like me to have a look at, at any of it now? Mm. And they will either say, yes, please, can you have a look at this? Can you have a look at this report? And I think once again, they're testing me. I think they are. And that's, of course, they're going to test me, Pookie. If they've had a bad experience, for whatever reason, at another school, they are going to check that I am worthy of being the school their child goes to. Absolutely right. So I will look at the paperwork if they ask me to and say, would you like me to tell you what my initial view is? And they say yes. And I've had that and I've, I've I've told them it and they go, oh, okay. And do you know what, Pookie? It's like I've I've passed the first test. You validated. Yeah. yeah. And they they go, okay, we'll move on to, you know, <laughs> we'll move on to the next stage. But I expect nothing less. And I think as Senkos, we should be ready for that. Not oh, oh, this parent is being a bit pushy. It's their child, it's mm. their child's future. And actually, we are so important in paving that way. So I had a parent came in and they said, we really think our child should have an EHCP. So I said, okay, and we had a, another meeting and we looked at it and I said, from what I can see, I think we should look into this further. And they said, at the old school, they just kept saying that, but they kept fobbing us off. You know, a bit like, a bit like the lift in Dirty Dancing. We'll do it later. We'll do it. And they <laughs> never did get the lift. And so I put timescales in for them. They really liked that. I said, right, it, I will do what I can do. And what I don't know, I will find somebody who can help us. And they said, Ginny, that is all we've ever wanted to hear. And we just want timescales, we want meetings, and we want somebody to tell us what they do know and to tell us the things that they don't know because yeah. that's, that's human and, and that is honest. Quite interesting, speaking to other colleagues, some people can see that as like as why would you say that you don't know something you know as a professional shouldn't we pretend that mm. we know things because it makes us appear that we don't know what we're talking about i don't know everything i don't know everything i have children coming into my care who have conditions i don't know about and what i do is i find out about them I go online, I go on to the different groups I'm on, I go on Twitter, I ask you, Pookie. You know, <laughs> I ask people to give me guidance to find out about it. And the next meeting, I say, I found out this and I found out this. And that's parents want to know that we care about their children and that we will do what we say we'll do. So I do have different, different kinds of parents. There are some parents who, for whatever reason, have got these barriers up and I need to prove myself over a long amount of time 
for them to trust me enough for for us to be able to have those conversations about getting outside agents in and i i don't push it i i really do listen to the parents and i might go in thinking i'm going to say one thing in a meeting but it might change because the time isn't right and i gauge it and how do you go about knowing i mean because that's the thing when you don't know how do you know how do you work out what to do next if you are in that situation where you don't know so you said sometimes you'll go and research and and sometimes you you know you might feel a little bit uncertain about how next to, to proceed i mean do you work as as part of a team or where where do you go next when you're unsure of, often i will uh, get in touch with uh, educational psychologists because they are from my point of view and in my experience they are a great knowledge for me I have built up a really good network of outside agents of occupational therapists, portage workers in preschool. So I get in touch with different people who know more than I know and yeah. say, what do you think? And that works really, really well. I also do my own research by reading around and then take back to the parents where I'm at often parents they come to me with their own books for me to read yeah. things for me to look up on the internet and that is brilliant because actually they know their children yeah. and they say i think you should read this because i think this 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 is what this epitomizes my child what do you think um and it really is in liaison with lots of people i think the worst thing we as Senkos can do is to be tunnelled. I think we have to be ready to accept guidance from those who can help us. And parents are amazing at giving us guidance. And parents know their children best. And when I have phone calls with parents, I write notes so is that we've got all the information we can about those children children coming in we make sure that the classroom is set up right for them because that's the other thing when children first come into our setting we want to make sure they're coming into an environment that they feel safe and that they feel confident and comfortable in so i think one of the most important ones is the uh the parent and the school, but also having the outside agents giving us advice as well. Absolutely. And I think actually uh, really listening to the research and the expertise that parents and carers bring is, you know, um, we can do that in a meaningful way, as you say, it's, it's so, so much to the benefit of the child. I don't think there's any researcher in the world that can match uh, what a concerned parent is able to do uh, when worried about their child. What if you are confronted with a parent or carer who has done this research and they're absolutely convinced on a point and it just doesn't match up with what you think is going on for that particular child? Do you ever have that situation? I think there has to be a lot of conversation. I think what sometimes happens is things that are happening at home mm. are not the same as what are happening at school. And it is acknowledging that. And actually what is seen in one context may not be seen in another context. It, there may be masking involved or it may be the different way that the environments run. Sometimes children appear to function better within a class classroom situation because there are the very set routines and mm -hmm. such like but then they may go home and they have been so careful and so wanting to be the same as everybody else that they may um have outbursts at home it's the old i'm sure you've heard of it the the pot bottle yes the pot bottle situation that the child is in school and Things happen in school, but they keep it to themselves. They keep it to themselves. And each time something happens, it's like the bottle is being shaken. 
they get in the car and the parent says how's school been and the child literally explodes so it is acknowledging that there may be different behaviors at home and at school and I do think often, in my experience, to have an educational psychologist coming out, and I work with amazing educational psychologists who, who absolutely look at what's happening at home, what is happening at school, and then they are able to help us, yes. help us, because I would like children to be even across both and if we can do that by putting in systems that are the same across both if we can have um we have different things like we have um uh sensory boxes that have got things from home that come into school children bring things in from home to school if that works for them so systems that work in one environment we try to have in the other environment i also think if we can inform parents when school is a positive place for their child, it's really, really important. By phone calls, I take photos and send them home because as parents, we don't always believe it unless we see it. We don't. We don't because that's the nature of being a parent. So if there has been um an incident where a child hasn't been very happy, say in the playground or whatever, and I go out to monitor it, and that child is having a great time on a pogo stick, for example, I'll take a photo and I will send that home because parents also need that reassurance. Yeah. So I think it's, it is that reassurance. And sometimes a parent may, may want a, you know, seek a diagnosis that maybe the school isn't seeing within the school setting but then the parents know the child best. So we have a discussion about that. And the parent, you know, I say, yes, go, you know, go for the diagnosis because you feel that that your child is exhibiting, you know, um, those, those certain traits. And the parents go, thanks. Because it's not either or, it's not either or, either or at all it's us working together so once again it's working together and listening and acknowledging it and you talk about the role of empathy in your role and that being a kind of big passion for you how does that play out why does it matter so much that empathy there's this great great example of empathy and it's in the book that I told you about, the book by Peter Basil Getty called The Empathy Instinct. There was an art installation in an American museum. And the art installation was putting on a pair of headphones and listening to somebody's story. And as you listen to that person's story, you also were given their shoes and you put your feet in their shoes. And as you listen to the story through the headphones, you walked around that art gallery wearing that person's shoes. And that to me is the essence of empathy. The fact that parents who have children with additional needs, it is their whole life. And if we can put ourselves in their shoes, we will begin to understand more. It's not about the hour before the child comes into school. It's not about them picking their child up after school. It is about the child all the time for that parent. Yeah. And the wonderful Brené Brown talks about empathy, about actually sometimes parents are overawed by everything they have to do with and for their child and it can feel like a dark hole and as educators we need to say do you want me to climb down that ladder and come down and stand with you and stand alongside you and be with them and I think the moment that we can be with parents and parents know that 
we truly do want to feel what they're feeling, then there is that connection. And when we get that connection, then we can all help the child together. So I think it is about consciously trying to understand what parents are going through. I think the empathy also works by actually on a daily basis go out, going out and having the conversations with the parents about what the child's been doing during the day, all the positives. I heard a parent, no, I did a talk and a parent messaged me and said, I was the parent who dreaded the teacher coming out to say what my child had done wrong that day. And it breaks my heart. Our role is to make connections and to walk alongside those, those parents. And I think we could learn a lot from um, medicine. Peter Basil Getty, he talks about having a bedside manner. Now, if you've ever been into hospital and taken your child into hospital, I hope everybody else has had this experience that the bedside manner they have is caring. Everyone is, everyone is together on, on this. We are as one. And I think we in education can learn from that. I heard an amazing parent talk and she said, um, her child had a medical condition. And when the person in the hospital spoke to the child, they were chatting about the child. And the next time something came from the hospital, the headed note paper had a picture of a pug on the top of it because the child had a pug. Oh, wow. And the letter, to the child had a picture. And it makes me really emotional because that is a little thing, Pookie, but it's such a big thing. And that became such a positive link between home and school because that person from the hospital had just picked up on that about the child and the child couldn't wait for the letters to come home from the hospital and then the child was sending the letters back and suddenly everybody's shoulders go down and mm -hmm. there is everyone is just working together um jamil zaki the war for kindness which is another book that i've told you about i love this idea we catch one another's empathy it's a lovely idea how wonderful is that that we catch one another's empathy and when I first found, found out how strong the, the role of empathy was, I actually had to consciously think about it. And that's okay, because actually we, you know, um, we talk about the consciousness and then it became more a way of being. Mm. But the other thing is, the children in my care became more empathetic. So I have seen children, they have changed and become more, more empathetic because they've seen it. And we have our mirror neurons, don't we? What yeah. we do, others mirror, whether it is children, whether it is staff, whether it is parents. And that is really, really powerful. And the other day, a child came up to me and I don't teach him anymore, but he came up to me and then he said, you don't look, you don't look too good this morning, uh, Mrs. Bootman. Uh, Mrs. Bootman needs a cup of tea and then oh. she'll feel better. And I was like, wow, he actually had, um, he had looked at my expression. He'd looked at my behavior. He, he, he'd done what I think is called cognitive empathy he'd read me as a person and from that he then decided what he would do to make me feel better and and, and it blows me away the role that empathy 
the it, it breaks down barriers, doesn't it, Pookie, by having that empathy and consistently being like that. I think that's important as well, that everybody knows that there is a consistency to actually, actually, if I need to go and see the Senko about something, I know that person will listen to me without judging me, but will be with me. Yeah. Does that mean that you have quite a heavy load to carry though because if you are kind of getting in the hole with your children and their parents and there's perhaps a lot of worry and fear and guilt and shame sometimes then do you carry that or are you able to walk away i think that's really interesting because they also talk about um that you can when you are feeling that you are unable to, at that moment in time, um, carry that empathy with you, then you acknowledge it and then you, I suppose, pass the baton on to somebody else. Mm -hmm. And that's really important. I'm, I'm really pleased that you mentioned that. You know, when you, you're having a bad day and you mm -hmm. are having a bad day, that we acknowledge that and we ask another member of staff or a teaching assistant when we are in that environment where people are uh, empathetic that we say um mrs so-and-so can you just have a word with so-and-so or so that we can pass that over to somebody else so that we do share it because it's important to look after ourselves it's the old adage isn't it put on your own um, oxygen mask before you put on somebody else's. Um, so I think we do have to be very, very aware of our own capacity to be able to shoulder it. And when we aren't able to, that we do ask somebody else to help us out. Absolutely. And I think that is really important. And I do think that, you know, you talked about uh, being a Senko earlier as being kind of almost like a vocation or a calling, a real passion that people have. And in my experience, often the kinds of people who are drawn to these kind of roles are not necessarily so good at knowing when to look after themselves. Very good at looking after everyone else, but not always so good at looking. And after once again, themselves. it has to be a consciousness. Actually, I'm not going to be any good to anybody else if I burn out or if you know, if I take too much on. And so, yes, I think it is that consciousness. Actually, I need to ask for help. And asking for help, I think we need to see as a, as a strength. Yeah. And we need to see ourselves as role models, perhaps, in, in doing that too, don't we? And I think as a role model, we mirror it and then other people do pick up on it. In my experience, mm. my, my colleagues, they, they, you know, we all have got that, that empathy. We all are role models for one another. Yeah, absolutely. On a totally different note, I have to ask you about chickens and how much we can learn from chickens. Well, I got chickens in the first lockdown and I have to say it's been such a long time that my chickens have laid eggs those eggs have hatched and now oh, wow. they are laying eggs so <laughs> that, that is how long yeah yeah i mean that, that it you know when you think how long how long has covid been you know wow. I, I, i've got i've got baby chickens now laying eggs so i go out in the mornings and i let my chickens out and you have all different kinds of chickens do you have chickens pookie no, I don't have chickens, Ginny. I, I think I'll be regretting that by the end of this conversation. Right. Then. right. Chickens, if you're feeling sad, you go out to your chickens, you let the chickens out, and some chickens just get the food that they know where it is. They always go to the same food, right? They are just... The chickens, like the... I don't know, the chickens are just always like it the same, you know, and I think some of, we all like things the same, don't we, sometimes. Then I have me other chickens. They just run around looking for the food. Pookie, the food's always in the same place, but they have to run around, they have to run around, have a, you know, have a little, have a little gas with their friends, have a little chat, and then they come back and the food was always there, Pookie. So, <laughs> you know, I think we can learn a lot from chickens because some chickens go 
and some people just like the calmness i'm mm -hmm. gonna get up this morning and i'm gonna have my frosties and i'm gonna have it in the same bowl with the same spoon don't know about you pookie i have a bowl and a spoon that i like yes yes, yes. you know and and i do mm -hmm. you know you know whereas some people would go oh this morning what shall i have i might have frosties i might have porridge you know i might have a little bagel with a bit of cheeky cream cheese and then they go oh but i will just have the frosties you know i'll come back to the frosties <laughs> and and then i have some some of my chickens just go off i don't know where they think they're going and do you know what happens they come back and i have to have a bit of food left for them because all the other chickens have eaten all of all of the food so i think I call them my chickens of hope because, and then I never know how many eggs they're going to lay, right? And then some of them lay where they should. And I mm -hmm. open the little box and it's like a gift from heaven. Oh, oh it's amazing. <laughs> Just to give every egg, I thank them because, mm -hmm. you know, you do, don't you? But then I have that, you know, the rogue chicken, you know, you know that, you know, that person in your life who just goes, I'm just going to run off and I'm going to lay my egg wherever today and, <laughs> and you've got to find it so i just think chickens are amazing because they bring happiness and they bring a little bit of chaos mm -hmm. and i've got one chicken i have to tell you one chicken gets out every day every day gets out and people go ginny did you know your chicken's out but do you know what pookie it always comes back. Oh, really? Yeah. So you've got those friends, you know, those friends, colleagues, children who go, mm -hmm. I want that freedom. And they go <laughs> out and 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 they always come back. Yeah. So it's, and the, but you know, every chicken always comes back at night because they just need to come back. So they mm -hmm. can have their freedom, whatever, but they always come back at night. And, and they're always pleased to see me. I give them grain, they take grain out of my hand. So oh. it, it's kind of, it's a little bit of love really, Pookie. That's lovely. Who knew that chickens were such a fascinating study? But there you go. And I guess it, actually, just like you were talking before about creating that kind of safe space so a parent or carer who hasn't been heard before is able to finally talk and talk until their balloon is empty you kind of do that for the chickens it's safe and warm and nice here so it, it's safe and warm and nice and then and they and they lay different colored eggs which is even more exciting wow. so i go in and yeah depending i guess it's what breed they are but we have different color so we know what which which chicken has laid which egg and they give us they give us the gifts that they give us. But yeah, they come back to the safety and we all need that safety. I love that analogy. You yeah. know, they all go back to their safe place. That's lovely. That's really lovely. I feel our time is coming to a, to a close. What, what thought would you like to leave people with? I think it comes back to the art installation. And I think it comes back to when you get the spiky email, when you get the parent who comes in, who has got their armour on, there is a reason. There is a reason. There is a story behind that. And actually, listen to understand and put yourself if you can in their shoes and the more transparent the more honest you are the more connections you will have with those parents and over time the relationship that you have with the parents is something that will aid their child in their journey those, the parents I work with ask me so many things because they trust me. They trust me. And when we've got the trust, that is when the barriers go down. And when the children 
the children get the best education and and the best relationships and the children see that the the children see that they see us talking to the parents they see the positivity and that is what it's all about it's about us all working for the children together and that the children can see we are like a human comfort blanket for them they know we're we are there for them